Hi there, my name is Steve Gearhart, and this is my panel for OnCon 10. Yes, this is my panel of the anime of the Tokugawa Shogunate. Uh, thank you so much for sticking around and watching it. Look forward to your questions at the end. Just to let you know, I can't show any uh, actual anime clips because we'll shut down uh, OnCon on YouTube if I do, so we don't want that. Um, you might hear some ambient noise coming from the city of Baltimore, so you might hear some sirens, you might not. We shall see. And um, other than that, let's get into it. So before we get into the anime that kind of gives a good picture of the Tokugawa Shogunate, um, <clears throat> I want to kind of give you a overview of, Shoga of, of the Shogunate history and also how the Tokugawas came to be a Shogunate. Uh, it's kind of interesting and it kind of gives you an, a, a flavor for how the anime were created. So in order to do that, we're going to have to go back in time. We're going to have to go back to around uh, 650 AD when, or, or 660, the, the time is murky, I'm going to call it 650 AD, when the first um, shogun was appointed by the emperor. Now, the word shogun is kind of an interesting word, and it also denotes the fact that at that time, it was a temporary title. It was not a permanent title, it was not hereditary, it was the emperor saying, I need somebody, you're it, you're going to be the Shogun. And the initial reason for that was to basically defend against the barbarians. So the actual title of Shogun, uh, if you do it a literal translation, is Commander-in-Chief of the Expeditionary Force Against the Barbarians. So, basically what that means is that the Shogun, if you came from a clan or a family or you're a lord or diamo or whatever, and you had a pretty good army and you knew what you were doing, the emperor might tap you and say, hey, I need you to be the shogun to take care of this problem. What that means is that you would have the power of the entire imperial army and anyone who is allied with the imperial family. So all those people are under your command, number one. Number two, if you are defending against somebody, whatever territories are you are defending, come under your temporary rule so you have direct access to uh, basically uh, stocks and provisions so you need to be able to make the order of going I need more food I need more weapons and you need to be able to just say that to people and, and have that order obeyed that would extend if you were um, quelling a rebellion and you were retaking land and you become as Shogun you're you're basically the uh, you're you're placing a martial law on the lands that you retake. If you're doing an invasion, then you're going to be the occupier of that land and you, your, your word is law because you're backed by the emperor of Japan. But it was temporary. So once you got the thing done, you would come back to the emperor and the emperor would say, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, we relieve you of the title of Shogun and in reward, you would be given much higher status. Like you would be really high up in the court. You would be given more lands. You give me more lands to make rice from, which is the base of your economy. And, you know, a lot of good things will happen to you for doing this thing. So that way, you know, even if in the short time that you're a shogun, that you have a lot of power, the emperor softens that by when he takes it away from you by saying, but here's all the riches I'm going to give to you. At which point you're just like, okay, cool. And, Odds are is that if something else were to happen in the future, the emperor, you're you're the emperor's go-to guy, basically. So there were about six or seven of those types of people of that type of shoguns. Then in 1192, a curious thing happened. Um, there was a show. Uh, there was a a, a lord um, by the name of I'm going to try and make sure I get it pronounce it pr uh, correctly. My Japanese is really horrible, so if I mispronounce stuff, I, I do apologize. Um, so there's this guy named Minimoto, I'm sorry, not Mini, Mini, Mina, Minamoto, Yorimoto. So I'm going to call it Yorimoto. Um, he was a very powerful lord, um, a very astute uh, military commander, uh, was known for efficiency in the rule of his realm, so to speak. And in 1192, uh, he had been kind of, this is what happens when you kind of, are the winner of a lot of battles and you kind of get a little bit of a big head. 
he started getting other smaller houses kind of attracted to him, like, you know, saying, oh, hey, we're, we want to be your friend kind of a thing. And so his power started not to rival the emperor, but it was starting to grow. And the emperor, at the same time as this was happening, the emperor's power was starting to weaken a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me. And, but the emperor at that time, who was, um, let me make sure I get his right name, um, Go Shirakawa. Go Shirakawa was also waking up every day as emperor and kind of going, I don't really want to do this anymore. I don't want to do the day-to-day -day thing. I don't want to have to deal with palace intrigue. I don't want to have to deal with playing all these lords against each other and, and you know, to keep my power base going. I don't want to be Machiavelli. He didn't know who Machiavelli was at that time, but that's basically what he was saying. I, I don't want to do these things anymore. I want to be able to focus on what I think is important. And Go Shirakawa thought that things like le upping the standard of culture and and literacy in Japan was important. He felt that having a better justice system run by the imperial family was important. Um, and it was. And he felt also that his spiritual duties as emperor, which were a large part of his duties, was supremely important. And those were the things that he wanted to focus on and work on. But he couldn't do that if he's also doing the day-to-day -day stuff, right? You know, handling rebellions, handling, having to handle any famines, any natural disasters. Uh, if uh, one particular house is getting a little uppity and they're making noise and, you know, having to play somebody against each other, he just didn't want to do it anymore. So he kind of looked at the Shogun system and he looked at it and he said, okay, well, here's a guy who's supposed to be taking temporary power and he's supposed to be a ruler as well as a military commander. And the basis of his rule is his military command and the backing of the imperial family. Well, instead of making this a temporary position, why do I make this a permanent position as a hereditary title? So he changed the Shogun position to that. And the person he decided to go to was a person who was kind of vexing him. So <clears throat> in those days, in feudal societies, one of the best ways to get somebody on your side is to reward them, make them your friend, lavish gifts on them, praise them, give them promotions. It didn't hurt that Yorimoto, the guy who was causing problems and kind of raising his stature, it didn't hurt that he actually knew what he was doing in terms of the military. He actually really did. And again, his realms were very efficiently run. He was not poor. He was not destitute. He had respect of other people. He had a lot of other people behind him, which is important. So he had his own way of dealing with the things that the Emperor Go Shirakawa didn't want to deal with. So he said, okay, buddy, you are my Shogun. And it's going to be permanent and it's going to be hereditary. So there you go. I'm going to take care of these things <clears throat> and you're going to take care of the day-to-day -day management of my realm in my name. That's a lot of power. So once becoming the Shogunate, the Kamakuras did very well for Japan. Uh, they instituted a lot of um, progressive ideas in terms of cultural uh, ideas, literacy, military technology. A lot of things happened under the Kamakuras uh, that were that was actually pretty good uh, for the Empire of Japan, for the for them themselves, and also for for the Emperor. It kind of fell apart in 1333 when Emperor Go Dago. Uh, decided that he wanted to retake the the um, the throne, so to speak. Yeah, he was emperor. Yeah, he did have the powers that that the that he was left with. You know, the justice system, uh, spiritual, you know, cultural, those kinds of things. But he wanted the day to day. He wanted the power, right? So in order to take that back, <clears throat> he was going to have to break the Kamakuras, which he did in 1333. He instituted the Ashikaga family, which was instrumental in helping him do that. So they became the new shogunate, the Ashikaga, the Ashikaga shogunate. And then, you know, after a couple years, few years, the, the Ashikaga shogunate kind of said, you know, we like the old system better. 
And so they made it a point to go go Dago after a couple of battles of saying, hey, look, you're the emperor. We don't want to kill you, right? Because that would make everybody ha unhappy and everything would just fall apart. So you're not going to win. So why don't you just step back and let's take care of everything. Come on. Help us help you. And Godego kind of looked around at the situation and just said, yeah, I don't want to die either. So you got it. So the Ashikaga uh, shogunate uh, gained back a lot of the power and they became the, the shogunate up until the Sengoku period or the Warring States period. <clears throat> and that's um, a tragic story right there because that is the result of what happens when you don't win a civil war. So despite being able to take back power from the emperor and being the shogunate again, uh, the Ashikagas were not as good as the Kam Kamakuras were in, in basically governance and what they were trying to do. Um, it's not that they were bad, awful people. They weren't. Um, it wasn't like they were dictators and stomping people into the ground or anything like that. No, no, no. It's just that they were just okay at their job. Basically, they just kind of did the bare minimum and were able to get through things. Uh, basically, what had happened is that, that they were never really that much of a big military power to begin with, that the Kamakuras were, and they had to rely more on a feudal system to get people to obey them, and they really rather spent time at court trying to affect policy decisions in that manner, as opposed to actually ruling, um, direct ruling, as the shogun was supposed to be doing. Keep in mind that uh, while the shogunate was the main power of the land, they still had to deal with the emperor, that you still had to deal with the imperial court, you still had to deal with the royal court, and you still had to deal with a whole bunch of other people. It's a feudal system, so the further you go out from the center of power, the harder it is to get people to obey you, so to speak. So the shogunates had to also exercise not only military power, but some type of uh, a level of political sophistication. And the Ashikagas um, did that okay. And like I said, they didn't have a very powerful military force. They were more reliant on their allies than they were themselves. And they tried to, in, in to make up for that, that's why they went to the royal courts and the imperial courts to try to influence policy there to get people to ally to them, to, to them and to their cause. Um, <clears throat> and it did all right. It, it was okay. Um, again, it, it's not that the, that Japan necessarily suffered under under the sh their shogunate rule. It's just that they didn't do very well outside of that shogunate rule. In other words, you know, it's not like they made as many advancements. It's not like life improved that much or anything of that nature. So they they were just okay. The problem came right before the Sengoku period. And what happens is that one of the major things that an emperor has to do in their lifetime is to anoint or appoint a new shogun when the when the current shogun either retires or dies that is a very important role to fulfill because basically you're you are as emperor saying i'm choosing the guy who's going to run the country for me right so you want to make sure that you 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 are as informed as possible you want to make sure that you have the best applicants as possible and you want to make sure that the shogunate is giving you enough opportunities for you to choose that person to appoint as the new head of the shogunate um <clears throat> usually it is like i say hereditary so usually it's, it's just a matter of teaching the right person now hereditary means in japanese feudal systems it doesn't necessarily mean the firstborn son it can be whoever who is in charge of that title decides who the next person is going to be. That's what they mean by hereditary. So it's, it doesn't even necessarily have to be by blood. Often what you see in Japanese customs is that somebody will adopt somebody, another, another person's son as their own because apparently they know what they're doing and they want that for their family. So it, it's kind of one of those things is for the greater good of the family, we're going to adopt somebody and make them our, our next leader of, of the clan or whatever. So <clears throat> that also transfers to, to uh, the shogunate. So often what you have is if you if the shogun family itself can't provide an heir to to the position, 
then they have what's called candidate houses. And it's about five of them. And each of these houses, the, you know, they do their normal things as they're, as they're titled to do whatever their, their, their title is in the hierarchy, but they are loyal to the Shogunate family. And one of the things that they have to be able to do at any given moment is provide a possible heir to the Shogunate position. Should the Shogunate family not be able to do it themselves and carry on the Shogunate name. That has actually only happened, I believe, five times in Japanese history. But anyway, so the Ashikawa's family could not provide an heir. The, the heir to the to the shogunate was too young. Was, the dude was a little baby, literally. So there were two candidate houses that they had that were rivals of each other within the shogunate. And they said, okay, well, we'll provide our heirs. Right. So one family provided one guy and the other family provided the other guy. And they said, both of them said to the emperor, if you don't choose our guy to be the head of the Ashikaga Shogunate, we're going to go to war with, with the other family. And whoever comes out on top, you know, they're, they're going to be the, their guy's going to be the Shogunate, the, the Shogun next Shogun. The emperor doesn't want this little war to happen. But he doesn't know what to do. And he's looking around. He's looking for other candidates to figure out, like, how am I going to do this? And he doesn't make a decision at all. This causes these two rival factions within the Ashikaga uh, Shogunate to rival each other and go to other lords and ladies of the realm, so to speak, to garner support. So then at this point... It becomes these two families going out saying who can get the most and best support, meaning who can raise the largest army if we actually need it. So politically speaking, if you're a lord of the realm and one of these, if a member of one of these clans comes up to you and says, hey, we want your support. You have to make a decision about whether who you're going to support or whether you're going to sit this one out. If you sit this one out, you know, you win nothing. If you choose one of these guys, then you have a 50 50 chance of either being rewarded greatly or being punished greatly. So you have to make the right decision. So people started making decisions and they started saying, okay, well, you know, we're going to support you. Don't say this go to war thing. Nobody's going to do that. And just, you know, we'll, we'll make the point. We'll talk to the, we'll send our, we'll send our representatives to talk to the emperor and just please your case for you. You say, we support you, but don't, don't be talking this war stuff. Okay. Like, why don't we keep it, keep it tapped down? That's what they were saying to these rival factions. And they did not listen. So, um, <clears throat> finally, both factions of the Ashikawas said, Ashikagas said, okay, here we are. And the emperor just looked and said, oh God, I don't know. I, I, uh, and still could not make a decision. Both families are literally living across the street from each other in Kyoto. They start insulting each other. Insult turns into fist, fist fights. Periodic duels happen to the death. Revenge duels to the death. They start lobbing arrows into each other's compounds. Everybody else in the nation, is the Japanese Empire, is looking at it going, Oh, crap. What's going on here? Until finally, one of the two rival factions, we don't know which one, set an arrow on fire, bink, sent it over, and then they sent one over. That is what started the Onin Civil War in Japan. Kyoto burned. They had to evacuate the imperial family, the emperor, everybody. Everybody had to evac out of Kyoto. Kyoto burned to the ground. Everyone just went, and the nation just went, oh God, we're going to war. And they tried to keep it limited to the Kyoto area and let the two families duke it out. They really did try. They really did try not to get in on it, but they were sucked in on it. And the two rival families went at each other so hard, so hard, that they killed each other off. They killed every single member of each family off. There was no more heirs. So the emperor said there, oh my God, I have no one. 
okay, I'll, uh, there's a great nephew over there who's, I think, 15 years old in the uh, Chicago's. I'll, uh, this guy, this guy, please take the Shogunate role. We'll have somebody advise you, blah, blah, blah. And the two f factions of either side said, <clears throat> we've been drawn into this. Blood has been drawn. We need to keep fighting until one of one side wins. There's too much revenge here. And that was the Onan War. And nobody won. The Emperor retreated back, rebuilt part of Kyoto, started that project. The remnants of the Ashikaga shogunate protected Kyoto, and that was it. And the rest of the land of Japan went to war with each other. <clears throat> to the point that suddenly some of the more senior commanders kind of looked around and said, we don't have a shogunate. There's nobody there to stop me from turning around and going to my neighbor and taking his butt over, killing his family and taking his lands. There are clans out there that are going, we've been held back from doing our revenge trip for 50 years now. Maybe it's time since nobody's there to stop us that we can get revenge on the clan next door. Things fall apart. So suddenly, instead of having a unified empire, you have all these different little kingdoms, little principalities, little whatevers going toward each other. And that is the Sengoku period, which we all know is about 100 years or so of suck. Okay, and this is where anime tells us that in history, and yes, this actually did happen in history, Oba Nobunaga unifies Japan under his grand army. His top two lieutenants in those armies were the Toyotomis and the Tokugawas. The Toyotomis had a better public image. The Tokugawas did a lot of the grunt work. Uh, the Toyotomis, it's not to say that the Toyotomis didn't do anything. They did a lot. They just were able to present themselves better, honestly, to the public. And <clears throat> so when Obinobagaga won, he was starting to consolidate, consolidate his power so he could become the next shogun and make his clan the next shogunate clan. He was assassinated. It's not 100% certain as to who's behind it. But a lot of people are pointing the finger at the Tokugawas. The Tokugawas had the most to benefit from it. They had the most to lose by not doing it. So a lot of people think they are the ones who are behind Obinobunaga's assassination, which created a, a um, power vacuum, which the Tokugawas felt correctly that they could win uh, in, a, in a show of military strength. And that's how they pu pushed out the Toyotomis and gained um, the emperor's um, appointment of being the next shogunate, which, of course, they called themselves the Tokugawa shogunate. And that's how they came into being. And it's kind of interesting how at first... They did a lot of really good things, but at a cost of a lot of good things. And uh, one of the major things that they did was create an economy based not on um, um, scarce metal wealth like gold and silver, but rather on production of rice. Um, they were able to uh, stratify the society into more of a lawful society, um, but it was at a cost of things. And... Over time, that would come to bite them in the butt. These were also, remember, the Tokugawas were the ones who also closed off Japan from the rest of the world at one point. So they made some really good decisions at the beginning, and then over time made a series of bad decisions. But we're going to get to all that now with the anime that, we, that best represents the Tokugawa shogunate. The first anime on this list of describing the Tokugawa Shogunate is the very well-known Ninja Scroll. I mean, even if you haven't watched this anime yet, you've probably heard this name uh, bandied about on the internet or talk amongst other otaku. Uh, this is a very well-known anime. came out in the 90s. Uh, it is uh, considered to be very impactful. Um, it's actually put up there in list next to Akira and Ghost in the Shell quite often. Um, it's got a bunch of heavy hitters in terms of production companies. Uh, JVC, Toho, Madhouse, uh, just to name a few. This was supposed to be actually two 45-minute movies, but it turned out to be a 95-minute movie. 
Um, again, this was a very impactful anime. It's very, um, uh, you know, it's one of the things that's known for is basically saying that anime isn't just for kids because it is very adult. We all know that. That's the other thing that people know about Ninja Scroll. There's a lot of, a lot of things going on in there. So um, the plot of this story is set, obviously, in the Tokugawa era or the Edo period. And um, it starts off with this um, little clan called the Yamashiro clan. And they mine gold, and but they do it in secret, and they send out ships uh, in the dark, in the dark of night, to send this gold to the Toyotomi Shogun of the Dark. And the reason why the Toyotomi Shogun of the Dark is called that is because he is not actually the real appointed Shogun uh, by the by the Emperor of Japan. So he is protecting his village. So as part of the payment, they're giving him this gold. He wants to use this gold to basically outfit his ninjas and warriors with Spanish um, firearms. And he wants to overthrow the current government, which is the Tokugawa Shogunate. Unfortunately, the, the latest shipment runs aground outside the seaside village called Shimoda. So the Shogun of the Dark sends out this ninja team called the Devils. And they pretty much kill everybody in the village. So... You know, a, ne a nearby village is like, what's going on? They hire another ninja team to go out and investigate. They go out there and the devils kill them, except for one survivor called uh, Kagero. And she um, manages to survive the attack. Everyone, all of her comrades are, are die a brutal death. And uh, as a result, they try to do things to her. And in comes our hero, Jubei, who is a former ninja, now mercenary, and he saves Kogera's life and uh, fights off uh, the devils and, kill, and manages to kill one of them. Uh, as a result, they you know, say thanks to each other, and he tries to hit on her, and she's very cold to him, and she just kind of walks away. And he's just like, okay, whatever, and he goes on about his life. And he doesn't get very far until he comes across a Tokugawa spy master by the name of Dakuan. And Dakuan says, hey... Look, you saw I saw what happened here, and those guys are involved in something that we're not sure about. This entire village is wiped out. We think that this guy, the Shogun of the Dark, is behind it, but I need help in proving that and stopping them, whatever their plan is. Will you help me? And Jubai is just like, mm, no. <laughs> he moves on, at which point he gets a, a throwing star thrown at him, and it's laced with poison, and Dakuan says, okay, well, um, tell you what, you help me, and I give you the antidote to the poisoned uh, throwing star I just I just got you with. And Jubaya's just like, eh, okay, I guess I'm on. And uh, so then they pair up and try to figure out what's going on, and of course, they come across Kagiro again, and she joins them, uh, because now she, because she has a vested interest in finding the devils and killing them, because they killed all of her friends. The rest of the story basically goes on them tracking down the gold, tracking down the various um, um, you know, machinations that are going on behind the Shogun of the Dark. And we learn <clears throat> towards the end that the actual real intention is to use the gold to create a ninja army to really just run rampant across Japan and just basically burn everything. And... Um, that's, you know, he's just a nihilist, and that's what he wants to do. So, of course, it's up to the trio to stop them, to stop him. So, that is basically the plot of Ninja Scroll. It is a very beautifully animated um, uh, movie. This is um, really, really uh, well done. I mean, when you're talking about 90s, uh, 90s animation, this is just kind of, you know, goes beyond the, 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 the part. This is really, really uh, a home run in terms of that. So, it's really... Fun to watch in terms of that. This is, however, an adult anime, so just remember that. No, no, no. Small kids need to be watching this. Um, you know, there, there's no Pokemon in this one. Anyway, um, so that is the idea of of Ninja Scroll, and then I'm gonna now I'm gonna talk about the actual rivalry in real life between the Toyotomis and the Tokugawas, which is showcased in this anime. That's kind of the whole point of this anime, was to show that the Toyotomis still were lusting for power in the beginning of the Tokugawa Shogunate. So, all right, it's time for the history lesson. 
So one of the neat things about Ninja Scroll is that it accurately portrays the rivalry between the Toei Tomi clan and the Tokugawa clan. Now what's interesting about these two clans is that they actually both rose in power underneath Oda Nobunaga. Now, if you know your Japanese history, Nobunaga is credited with the unification of Japan. In reality, he is one of three unifiers, himself, uh, the Toyotomi clans, and the Tokugawa clan. Now, um, what had happened was that Oda Nobunaga was about to conquer the rest of Japan. He had conquered a third, and he was about to plan to take over the inland sea provinces when he was assassinated. Um, the Toyotomis uh, went after the clan that assassinated him and basically wiped them out. Um, it is, some historians believe that it was the Tokugawas who planned and orchestrated the event. Nobody's 100% sure on that. So just throwing it out there. So anyway, so once Nobunaga was um, was killed, the Toyotomis were pretty well regarded. And the reason for that is that the leader of the clan, Hideyoshi uh, Toyotomi, was a very astute military commander. Uh, he was the son of a officer under Nobunaga, and he rose in the ranks, and Nobunaga kind of recognized that and, and helped bring him up and coached him on how to be a military leader. Um, not only that, but uh, apparently Hideyoshi was also a very good leader in other respects as well. And so once um, Hideyoshi was able to avenge Nobunaga's uh, death, he then got the recognition of the emperor. And the Ashikawa uh, Kaga um, shogunate still existed at this point. And there was that very, very weak Ashikaga shogun that was in Kyoto at this time. So not to make waves, Hideyoshi smartly said, you know what, we're not going to go after the shogun. I'm going to use my influence in court to try to achieve my goals. So he actually never received the title of Shogun. It was offered to him, but he just declined it to take it and actually made plans for his nephew to take on that title. Um, towards the end of Hideyoshi's life, he kind of got a little insane, um, killed a lot of members of his family, including the nephew, because he, he fathered a son that he felt was going to be better than the nephew. Anyway, so as this is going on, the Tokugawas, who are the other lieutenants of Nobunaga, uh, they were the third unifi unifiers, and we'll get to them in a moment. They were kind of jealous of the, of the Toyotomis because they just presented themselves better, and the Tokugawas were just kind of rough and ready kind of folks. And um, the emperor was just kind of like, recognized their power, their ability to do things, but they felt, the imperial court felt that leadership, fell more towards the Toyotomis than they did to the Tokugawas. So Tokugawa Yasu, who was the other lieutenant of Nobunaga, kind of let it happen, so to speak. When the Ashikaga um, shogun started to go ill, and it was quite apparent that he was going to die, and that the emperor was not going to continue the Ashikaga line, that's when things got a little interesting. And the Tokugawas kind of said, you know, look, we really know how to do this, and it should be us. So by way of proving it, and as is often the custom in Japan at this time, was to go to war with the rival clan and prove through battle that you're superior. Iyasu, Tokugawa Iyasu, and Hideyoshi Toyotomi um, went at it. About three or four insignificant battle, battles that nobody really won. And at the end of it, both of them realized that they were going to create the Sengoku, uh, Sengoku period all over again. And Tokugawa Iyasu is the one who backed off and said, you know what? No, let's not do this. Which gained him status. Because now the entire nation of Japan is just like, oh, we have another guy who has leadership qualities, just like Hideyoshi. One of the things that Hideyoshi used to do was um, take his, when he would have to go to war with somebody, once he took over lands or other lands, he would go to the ones that he defeated, to the leaders he defeated and said, look, I can either kill you or we can work together and we can make money together, basically. 
And through that way and through his connections at the Imperial Court, was able to gain a lot of allies that way. And people trusted him and, and that leadership style. It started to fall apart when Hideyoshi's mind started to fall apart. He was ordering certain trusted vassals to commit seppuku. Um, his uh, best friend he ordered killed. Like I said, he killed his nephew, put his nephew's head on a freaking pike, of all things. And so that his son could you know, take over for him and eventually become the shogun. So the Tokugawa has kind of looked at this and kind of said, mm, you know, this is not, this is, this isn't really that good. And was able, once the Ashikawa, Ashikaga uh, shogunate died, and then a year later Hideyoshi died, the Tokugawa said, look, on Hideyoshi's deathbed, and he did do this, asked the Tokugawa to watch over his, basically, I think it was 10-year-old son at the time, and to coach him to become a leader. And the Tokugawa said, we'll do that. Now, the emperor's looking around. He has no Ashikagas. The Toyotomis have a very, very young leader who can't be really be made shogun just yet. Who do you go to? And there sat Tokugawa Iyasu, saying, Hi, I'm ready. Get me in. Put me in, coach. And that's how the Tokugawas basically became um, the Tokugawa shogunate. The Tokugawas will become the third unifier, <clears throat> unifiers by becoming the Shogun and becoming very active in bringing the rest of Japan into, into the Imperial, back into the Imperial fold, so to speak. And he did it in a, in a combination of using Nobunaga's terror tactics against Buddhist temples. Nobunaga wasn't really a nice guy. And also using Hideyoshi's um, various leadership methods of involving the people that you defeated to be part of your plan, to be part of your vision. So he wisely did these things and he set up the Bakuhan or Bakufu government, which is called the tent government, uh, for the shogunate. And it worked really, really well until it didn't when the Meiji Restoration showed up. Uh, but anyway, that's how the Tokugawas became the Tokugawa shogunate. All right, this anime is one of my personal favorites, particularly of older anime. Uh, this one is called Sabu to Ichi Torimono Hike, also known as Sabu in Ichi's Detective Stories and Tales. Uh, this started off, of course, as a manga, and it uh, ran in, from 1966 to 1968 in Weekly Shonen, and then it went to over the big comic uh, in 1968 and lasted until 1972. The anime run was about a year from 1966, I'm sorry, 1968 to 1969. Um, it's it's a very uh, interesting anime because it, it delves on a topic that is not normally shown. And uh, what I mean by that is that we're doing a police procedural in the Tokugawa era in Edo, Japan. So this is actually in Tokyo during the Tokugawa period, and it and it shows it highlights how the police worked at this time. So it's definitely a police procedural, and the the main character um, <clears throat> Sabu is about the lowest that you can get on the ranks of this police force, and I'll talk about more of that in in, in a moment. Um, so he is part of what's called the Jirimochi, and he is assisted by a blind swordsman called Ichi. And the two of them basically go on um, the crime of the week, as I like to call it. You know, we have Monsters of the Week. Well, this has the crime of the week. And so it's about them being able to successfully um, fight crime. And uh, so, it's like I say, it's a, it's a police procedural. And the character uh, Itchy, the blind swordsman, is kind of happy-go-lucky and kind of just kind of in a weird way. And he's kind of enjoyable, but uh, also a little bit creepy at the same time. Um, Sabu is kind of more the brains of the outfit. He's the actual detective. Uh, he has an interesting weapon, which is a dagger on a chain. I, I am blanking on what that is called, but that is his weapon of choice. So, as I said before, they go on these little, um, crime adventures trying to keep the peace in, um, Edo, Japan, and as, as the police tried to do at that time. And a, a side story, kind of like an under, you know, subplot here, is that Sabu is engaged to Midori, a uh, young lady who's the daughter of the head of police in Edo in Tokyo, 
as we know it today. And he is an officer of the Togugawa Shogunate, which means that he is a samurai. And Sabu is not. So uh, there you go. So that's the plot of the of the anime. Um, I would go more into it, but I don't want to give away episodes. And you should really, really watch this. It is on YouTube. You can find it very easily on YouTube. It's a, um, it's a subtitled anime. All right. So let's get on to how the police worked in Tokugawa era Japan. So one of the reasons why I like the Sabu and Ichi uh, anime is because it talks about something that we don't normally think about, which is uh, how do police operate during a feudal system, under a feudal system, like the Tokugawa Shogunate. So here we are in Edo, Japan, now Tokyo, and we're hearing this story about these really low-level police officers working the beat, so to speak, in, in um, Edo, Japan. And it's kind of interesting because we get to see an idea of how that works. So basically what has happened here is that police are run by the samurai. And the, the, the overall chief of police, say for Edo, um, for the city of Edo, is appointed by, of course, whoever the lord is, the local magistrate, that kind of a thing. But it has to be a samurai. It has to be a high-ranking samurai. And because he's given the most authority and under him are various levels of officers. The top three under him, of course, are also samurai of varying rank. They have various duties. Um, the lowest rank was the Doshin are allowed to ride on horses around town and enforce patrols and things of that nature. But then we go past that. And what we go past is we get to the people who are not samurai, but they have powers of arrest. So while they don't have the the authority of a samurai being able to carry around a sword or whatever and ride a horse and bring people to justice, they are the actual detectives. These are the these are the beat cops. These are the people who, you know, they're rough and tumble. They're usually former criminals themselves, and um, they're working a a particular beat. A particular area in town to enforce the laws of the samurai and they take their direction from of course the samurai and <clears throat> these people are, are part of the hinimoki which is um again these are more civilians than they are actual military people so <clears throat> here you have people who are given direction by the samurai to go out and find out information they're basically informants they run um, CIs, they run things like that and, you know, come back to the samurai and say, here's what we find out. And they're the ones who actually go out and usually do the raids and, and, and whatnot. Um, the powers of arrest are very, very broad. Um, they can mean anything. They, you know, you can, as a genie Moki, you can walk in and just go, I think you have information I need. Come with me. So it's not like there's a lot of due process here. Um, so yeah, they're, they're able to do those kinds of things. And they act as a paramilitary force quite often. And under that level, there's another level under that. Now, the anime, Sabu Ichi anime, really talks about the, the, the levels still within the police hierarchy. So we're talking about the Hinimoki that take direction, direct um, direction from the, um, the samurai. But there is another level of this, which is called the Five Family Associations. And what these are, are that in the various areas that require... Uh, police pres presence under the Hidimoki, there are families that support the police. So they run their own police intelligence operations and they are part of five families, just like how there are 12 families that take care of suppressing fires. There are five families in a section that take care of crime in there. So that's what these people do. And this is what it looks like inside of a city. Now, if we go outside of the city, <clears throat> that's where we start to see other types of anime. We've seen the anime of, of groupings of farmers and swordsmen who are not quite samurai, but kind of know what they're doing. And they mete out justice. Well, they're actually part of the police force, too. They're part of the Hidimoki as well. And so that's where you get a lot of the stories about um, you know, justice at the hands of swordsmen. It comes from those guys. They're actually police. They're gathering intelligence. They're trying to help and assist in keeping the public safe, you know, doing the public safety thing. Also, what, <clears throat> what is interesting is that they existed at a time where the Tokugawa's had um, basically made samurais bureaucratic 
And so there wasn't a very large standing army. So these people were very instrumental in helping and putting down rebellions by providing intel and things of that nature. So I just wanted to show this and just kind of give you an idea of how the Tokugawa kept the poli uh, kept the peace in, you know, internally talking about crime and unrest and things of that nature. They actually had a form of police. It was kind of kind of cool that they were able to use not only samurai but also former criminals and farmers uh which is kind of unique but anyway if you get a chance to watch the sabu and uh itchy uh, detective tales please do so it's a really good anime this next little anime this lovely little anime called miss hokusai i chose this because i wanted to show kind of a a uh, idea of what culture looked like during the Tokugawa period, particularly in Edo, Japan, which would later, of course, be known as Tokyo. And this is something of a historical dramatization of an actual real-life person who is one of the daughters of the great artist Hokusai. Now, if you know that name, uh, you know exactly which uh, painting I'm talking about. If you don't know the pain, if you don't know uh, the name, then let me show you the painting, which you will most likely be familiar with. Uh, so here it is. So this started off, of course, as a manga. It was actually, the manga was during the uh, early to mid-80s, from 83 to 87, in Weekly Manga Sunday. Uh, you can buy three, you can buy all of them in three volumes. And, of course, the anime came out in 2015. Um, it's about 90 minutes long. It is a, a beautifully rendered anime. Um, it, like I said, it's, it's a historical anime, actually. And the... The artist Hokusai had four daughters. Uh, of course, the one we're talking about here is going to be Kasushika Oye. And the reason why we want to talk about her uh, in this anime is because she is the daughter that helped Hokusai in his painting endeavors. So she did a lot of apprentice work at first, you know, and she would do things like set up foundations on... on um, on paper for him to finalize, uh, you know, prepare paints, you know, buy, you know, supplies, those kinds of things. But as she worked literally side by side in the studio with her father, she developed her own technique and her own level of artistry, which is actually um, rivaled his own to the point that in the anime and in real life, um, Hokusai would often ever finish many of his paintings so the paintings that you have under the name hokusai are often collaborations with his daughter and there are even some paintings out there where it's not certain that it was actually hokusai himself or if it was his daughter that actually did the painting because she never signed the paintings because in order to get paid nobody wants to pay hokusai's daughter they want to pay hokusai himself so oe never really got a whole lot of credit for what she did in life now the anime of course takes place in Edo uh in 1814 so this is right in the middle of the of the Edo period things are kind of you know peaceful in the Tokugawa shogun at this at this time and we've got a really good snapshot of Edo Japan going on here. One of the subplots of this anime, of course, has to deal with um, her and her ability to be an artist. And even though she's not getting recognition, it's her ability to continue being an artist and getting some type of recognition. At some point, uh, her father was getting um, um, requests for shunga prints, which are woodblock prints that are basically erotic in nature. And so he kind of shunted that off onto her, and she started doing them, but a lot of people felt that they were too uh, cold, that she didn't really have a whole lot of passion behind the art. And so part of the anime is her trying to improve on that. And so she does various things to do that. As it turns out, when she does shunga prints about women in particular, um, absent of men, that's where they stop being cold and they actually, you start to see passion in them. And so there is a little eyebrow raised of going, oh, is she? And, and in, to answer the question in real life, yes, she was. Um, she was bisexual in, in real life. She did get married at one point, divorced because it didn't work out. Um, and she, it is known that she had women partners. Uh, so the other plot of this story is basically 
her taking care of one of her younger stepsisters um, who is blind and is somewhat ill. Now, the unfortunate thing here is that Hokusai, uh, both in the anime and real life, was very much afraid of, of sickness and dying as a result of and really didn't feel good around people who are disabled. So he never actually really did anything for his youngest daughter who was blind and, and sickly. So Oye took care of her, basically. And that's part of, of the story here of Miss Hokusai is her taking care of this this younger sibling and trying to be the artist that she wants to be in life. Um, it ends just like in life, where in 1857, during a summer's walk, she disappears. So one of the big reasons why I wanted to um, bring Ms. Hokusai into this panel is simply because it does such a great job of giving a snapshot of what Edo Japan looked like in 1814. It's really important to understand this because 1814 is really on the cusp of some very historical events, important historical events for Japan that happens there. And um, so about 40 years or so from 1814 we're going to get Commodore Perry showing up uh, opening Japan up to the world uh, <clears throat> you know in about 55 60 years from that point you were going to have the Meiji restoration where everything changes the Tokugawa Shogunate is taken out and new changes are coming in and modernization is the key word here um, but this is 1814, and it's right on the cusp of that. Now, you would think that, having said what I, what I just said now, the opening of Japan and the modernization of Japan, that um, Edo Japan would be a kind of a podunk kind of town, whatever. Well, the show, this movie shows that it wasn't, that it was a bustling city. It is a city. It shows Edo Japan as a city, as a city. Um, it's going to turn into Tokyo at some point, but right now it's Edo, Japan, and it has about a million people living there, which means that it has a local government, it has local firemen, it has um, systems, police systems, the whole nine yards that a city of its size would have at that time in, in, in the world. So <clears throat> instead of thinking about Japan in a samurai, royal samurai, you know, battling it out amongst the orchids or, or, or you know, the, that kind of stuff. Um, here we have just day-to-day -day Japan going on. So, you know, we, we see how traffic goes across the bridge. You know, it's commercial traffic. It's people meeting each other. You, we see a stratified um, social network happening we see how people fit into various pegs in that society we see um, basically what we're seeing is in urban japan at the same time we're also seeing hokusai's work hokusai's work at this point is in 1814 is kind of important um to japan unintentionally so so what Hokusai has done in his life, real life to this point, and, and most likely his daughter Oe, um, is to create this art that goes throughout the nation of Japan. People know who Hokusai is. They want paintings from him. They keep commissioning stuff from him. So people get to see Edo Japan. They get to see Mount Fuji, even though they've never been there and they might never get to be there. Um, so this artwork is very important to connecting people of Japan, various different parts of Japan together and focusing on the city of Edo. Here's the other interesting part of this, that artwork, like there's, um, what's called the 36 views of Mount Fuji that Hokusai did, and they were reduced down to postcard size. And it made it easier for people to use these things and send them out and say, hey, look, was that Mount Fuji? Here is the thing. This is what it looks like. Hey, and it became and it becomes a collector's item. And people want to see all the different aspects of Mount Fuji. Why is this important? Because these postcards made it to Dejima. Dejima, if you know your Japanese history, is where the Danish had to stay on that little small two-acre island where they were only allowed off that island twice a year. Um, but they still did a business, you know, like Japanese would still go to them to do mercantile business. So there was a lot still trade and things going on 
um, you know, between Japan and Europe, but just very limited through these very, very small um, places. Dejima wasn't the only island, island where foreigners were consigned to. There were other places that Europeans were consigned to f throughout Japan, but this was the most famous one. So anyway, Hokusai's postcards of uh, Mount Fuji made it to Dejima. And as a result, these things went back to Europe. And it told Europeans a story. They told them a story about this amazing mountain called Mount Fuji. So obviously they're looking at this wonderful art on these postcards. And they're asking their people, what is this? What does this mean? What, what, this is beautiful. What, how do I get there? I want to see this for myself. Suddenly Europe has more of an interest in Japan. Just not the casual commercial interest that's had thus far. In the past couple hundred years it's going people will kind of go i want to go there i want to see the sites i want to see the things and then you start getting more postcards from other artists that are contemporaries of hokusai you get postcards of you know uh, so it's like i believe it's 12 postcards of different scenes of of what ito used to look like and those went out then you would see postcards from Kyoto and those would go out and then there was a little business of sending it to these foreigners to send back to Europe and people were just buying this up it also eventually gets to guess where yes America and because we are who we are we want to make business deals with people in wherever and we want to have spheres of influence we get a hold of these postcards. It's not the only thing that made us do this. I mean, there was a lot of other factors, but this for the American public captures the imagination and says, and makes people again want to go, I want to see this place. How do I get there? How do I do the thing? So in 1814, unbeknownst to Hokusai and his daughter, they are giving the rest of the world a reason to come to Japan. And there's some good things with that comes with that. And of course, there were a lot of bad things that came with that. But that's a tale for another day. And of course, for the last anime to use to kind of showcase certain elements of the Tokugawa Shogunate, we are going to use the ever popular Samurai Champloo. Uh, for those of you who are Bebop fans, uh, you, of course, know that Samurai Champloo was also created by um, uh, Shinshiro Watanabe. Uh, it, of course, was a manga in 2004 and then got the anime treatment in 2004 to 2005. So uh, Sh uh, Watanabe wanted to kind of use contrasts to tell this story in towards the end of the Tokugawa period by using hip hop, infusing um, hip hop elements into not just the story but also the music of the of, of the series itself, and he, he successfully did so. Um, and it was very widely received in, in the West and did pretty well in Japan as well. Um, so the, the, the plot is fairly simple. Uh, Fu, who is the young lady of the trio, uh, is working in a tea house. Uh, she's been abandoned by her father from when she was very little, and she harbors resentment for that and wants revenge on her father. These two guys show up uh, for independent reasons into the tea house. Uh, one is Jin, who is a is a, who is an actual samurai, and the other one is Mugen, who is a bit of a lout. But both of them are superior swordsmen, and they both um, kind of embody different aspects of what it means um, to be a samurai in the last days of the Tokugawa um, uh, shogunate. Uh, Jin being the traditional samurai, and Mugen being the progressive force moving forward. And so the, the Fu, at, at, at the end of this, uh, the, the, the Fu's little tea house with her adoptive parents burns down and, and Mugen and Jin are about to be executed and she saves them. Uh, she flips a coin afterward and says, hey, if I win this coin toss, then you guys have to help me find my dad, the, the samurai who smells like um, sunflowers, and help me kill him. And so she flips the coin, and of course she wins, and they're off. They go on the road trip across Japan, kind of experiencing different aspects of how the Tokugawa shogunate deals with things like homosexuality, deals with the island of of Dejima, which is which uh, which is a two-acre island that foreigners have to stay on, 
uh, and aren't really allowed off of except for twice a year. Um, corruption within the Tokugawa Shogunate, things of that nature. So the series goes along those lines until, of course, the final few episodes where they do find her um, <clears throat> her father, who is, quite frankly, dying uh, from an illness, probably cancer. And as it turns out, he is actually a Christian, which is kind of unusual um, in this in this day and age in Japan during the Tokugawa um shogunate so um so there's that and of course you know she's trying to deal with that seeing how you know trying to get Jin and mugen to engage in a combat with him to to kill him and at the same time all these assassins from the toga from the tokugawa shogunate show up trying to kill mugen and Jin because of all the havoc and things that they've done in their road trip to find the samurai who smells like sunflowers um, a wonderful story, uh, very action shonen. You know, if you want shonen, here it is. And uh, but it touches on a lot of subjects, particularly Christianity in Japan during the Tokugawa Shogunate, which is not an easy thing. Uh, so let's go ahead and talk about that. Samurai Shampoo does a really, really good job at showing why the Tokugawa Shogunate collapsed under its own corrupt weight. Um, yes, they fought, yes, they raised on armies and yes, they fought, uh, to try to, um, prevent the Meiji restoration from taking them out, but obviously they lost. And there's, there are a multiple, uh, multitude of reasons as to why that happened, but it all kind of stems back to various decisions that they made during the Shogunate, uh, their Shogunate period. One of them, of course, was the idea of isolation. Um, we're isolated from the rest of the world. That's what they wanted to do. And they wanted to focus in on themselves. They decided that, you know, you know, we don't need to conquer other nations. We need to focus on ourselves, who we are as a nation, and to move forward with that. And it sounds like a good idea at first, but then you decide, then you discover that, well, you have all these people who are armed. You have all these people who are samurai. You have all these lords who have retainers or an or a standing force that they can use and there's nothing for them to to use those armed forces on they're not using them on each other it's a period of peace um they've you know they've the sengoku period is long gone and by this time in samurai Champlu, which if we were to loosely take the timeline it is probably at the moment that perry shows up the first time and so here you have a bunch of um, lords and ladies and people who are rich and general society that are looking at samurai, looking at the Bushido code and looking at the old ways and almost laughing at them, just saying, eh, yeah, whatever, dude. And you see that throughout the anime. And this happens, uh, this was happening right before Perry showed up in, in Japan. And another big problem with this uh, was that, okay, well, we have to have our soldiers fight somebody we have to have our samurai to fight something to do something we have internally generally speaking peace you know nobody's doing a rebellion to try to take out the tokugawas no one's trying to take out the emperor uh, what do we do here oh we've got oh you know what the europeans have been somehow sneaking off the island of Dejima again and then been recruiting christians again we need to put these guys down the first really big uprising was the Shambara um, uh, Christian uprising in, uh, I believe, 1616. And there was a lot of rebellions that, that mimic that, where there would be a group of Christians who are worshipping and then suddenly off from the hills come down to Tokugawa or their allies and just, you know, basically laying waste to everything. And so rebel little small rebellions would, would pop up. But it's still not enough to kind of say... Okay, what do we do with all these people? <clears throat> the interesting thing, excuse me, the interesting thing is that they turned the samurai class into a bureaucracy. They took away the swords. They, they made it uh, basically uh, not worth, economically speaking, a samurai's time, uh, worth his time to be an actual samurai. They would allow that title to happen they will allow it to be a hereditary and it would be something that would help you open doors in the bureaucracy but in terms of being a warrior 
it doesn't mean anything to be a warrior anymore because there's nobody left to fight, really. So here you have a whole class of people who are basically taken out of the field and said, here's your desk. <laughs> you know, this is what you're doing now. Um, and that doesn't really sit well with a lot of people. But over time, samurai become pencil pushers. They become corrupt. They become um, paid to be unemployed. That was a thing that um, lords would do. They would want to keep their, their samurai, and they would say, okay, well, we don't you want you really doing anything. We don't want you to like, you know, get any funny ideas, so we're just going to pay you not to take other jobs. So here's your stipend. And what happens? Well, you start getting corruption. You start getting a lot of gambling, a lot of vice in what was otherwise a uh, class of very stoic men who did not do these things. <clears throat> Suddenly, that is the norm. You can read about this in Masui's story, which is an autobiography of a mid-level uh, Tokugawa samurai, where he talks about selling swords. Swords, like you know, he goes, "Okay, well, you don't need the sword anymore, so let me help you for a fee sell it, so that you can have money to go gamble." So, you don't really have an effective military anymore. You don't have the old ways are crumbling; they're going away. And suddenly this guy Perry shows up from America in four ships and comes in and starts talking about saying, um, guess what? You're going to open up your markets because we want to come here. We saw these wonderful little postcards. We want to see Mount Fuji, right? This guy Hokusai really did it. This is really beautiful. I want to see it. You know, so basically we're imposing our will on Japan. And part of how the Meiji Restoration happened was because a, all the corruption in the Tokugawa Shogunate, just to get things moving. And the fact that they had, the Tokugawa's recognized that they had no way to fight us off. So the Meiji's, uh, the Meiji Restoration was about fixing that thing. Um, so when the Tokugawa's finally had to go to war with the, the Meiji Emperor, Emperor, the young Asian, uh, Meiji Emperor, they lost because they were using samurai who were not fit, didn't know how to use swords anymore. They were like probably two generations out from being really good sword masters. Um, they didn't have the armies of old, of Sakagarahara, of, of the feudal Japan, of Sengoku periods. There was none of that fire. Nothing was going on. What the Meiji's had was a standing army a trained army, a modern army, going up against a bunch of guys with old ideals and swords. And so there was, how could the Tokugawa's win? They couldn't. So that is basically how it ended and how I like how Samurai Champloo kind of sets up the idea that the Japanese government is just crap. And we're heading towards a place where we have to start moving forward now moving instead of moving backwards or standing still we have to move forward um and that is how the tokugawa's lost it all <laughs>Thank you so much for watching my panel. Again, my name is Steve Gerhardt. Um, I run a YouTube channel called The, the Unagi Observer. Uh, again, thank you so much for watching it. And in, I'm looking forward to your questions here. And afterwards, please enjoy the rest of Ancon. And as always, watch more anime.